Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you to Vanessa for inviting us. Uh, there's several members of our team here, so I will really give you preliminary data, but if there's other questions and you want more details, we certainly are available the next few days. So what happened is that the Undiagnosed Diseases Program at the National Institutes of Health in um, Bethesda, Maryland, identified about 50% of our undiagnosed disease patients had glycosylation abnormalities. And we wanted to define whether we were seeing true new glycosylation disorders or if we were picking up abnormalities in glycosylation related to other disorders. And so one of the ways to do that, and I'll talk a little bit more about our secondary findings tomorrow, but one of the ways to do that was to take the patients that we knew did in fact have new or rare CDGs and develop a spin-off protocol to study those in more detail. And so in May of 2014, we began to see our very first patients in this congenital disorders of glycosylation natural history protocol. And we've seen quite a few. I'll review those in a few minutes. These are not just American patients, though. I need to let you know that we will see patients from all over the world. The caveat being that we cannot pay for travel to the United States. However, if any patient or family wishes to participate, if you can get to the United States, anywhere in the United States, we pay for travel within the United States and all of the housing um, and food requirements for the admission. So that may be helpful to some of you. So there are multiple pathways. You've heard a little bit this morning from different speakers that have an impact on glycosylation in different ways. And because of our uh, protocol, we are able to follow patients with all different types of glycosylation across many pathways. But we're doing a very systemic study of exactly the same things on every single group of glycosylation abnormalities so that we hope that we'll be able maybe over time to define certain characteristics are more specific to certain patients in, with disorders in given pathways as opposed to just looking at the group as one large group. The interesting thing is that at the same time we were developing our glycosylation natural history protocol, the first deglycosylation disorder ENGLI-1 was discovered, and that's very important because in all other pathways of inborn errors of metabolism, there is a synthetic part of the pathway where you make glycans in this case, and then we've not ever seen before the part of the pathway where you have to break those glycans down. And so that's been a very exciting opportunity for us in our protocol. So we had... Um, a lot of lofty objectives. I think we've met quite a few of those, but we certainly are starting to delineate clinical and laboratory findings across all types of CDGs. We do very extensive medical and family histories in that, and I'm sure many of you in this audience have had your child evaluated in many different places. We actually take all of the medical records, laboratory data across multiple specialties, and we review all of those in great length before any patient is actually seen in our protocol. We do physical examinations. We have consultants across multiple specialties, as you've started to hear from neurologists. But we hear we have endocrinologists, we have hepatologists, which are um, liver specialists, we have um, cardiology, we have all different specialties available to us. So we are trying to get a better handle on diagnosing, um, giving you prognoses, and also developing therapies. We do perform molecular analysis if necessary, although most of our patients come already with a molecular basis, not just a biochemical basis. And we do obtain a number of tissues for future study. And we also share those tissues with other investigators blindly. So we, we actually, in America, it's called a material transfer agreement. But I have 12 that are specific to this protocol where we will share tissues not only from patients but also from family members if we have those specimens available so that researchers really can study uh, what is happening in both the carriers and also the patients.
and we are using the protocol to hopefully develop some future therapeutic studies. The clinical methods, all the subjects get a very lengthy list of um, tests done, including a baseline brain MRI, MRS, and in some cases that is um, a follow-up for something that's already been done locally. We look at the heart very carefully. There are some CDGs that have been reported over time to have dysrhythmias or cardiomyopathy, but all groups have not been studied, and so we're looking at that. Many CDGs have liver enzyme elevations, especially early on. That's not well understood. We don't understand what's going on with liver fibrosis or fatty livers, and so we are systematically addressing that. We're looking a lot at bones, so we do bone age for endocrine, um, and we do skeletal surveys. We do DEXA scans that look at um, bone strength, osteoporosis. We take clinical photography pictures so that over time we'll be able to see changes in the appearance of the children. <coughs> and we do a large number of medical evaluations across multiple specialties, which does include neurocognitive testing. At the National Institutes of Health, we're very lucky in that we have gotten the neuropsychologist who works on our autism protocol to become very committed to the CDG protocol. And so all of the things we've discussed this morning with our CDG population, children need more time, they may not be verbal, they may have vision or hearing problems, are really met well by Dr. Thurm, who is extremely patient. She can do some testing at the bedside. She does have a formal testing area. She comes back usually over several days, so she can give a very good idea about what's happening for the patient. And as Dr. Patterson identified, she points out a lot of strengths in adaptive skills in particular in this group of diagnoses. The blood work is extensive, I'm not going to lie. We do a lot of lab work because, as you all know, there are hematologic and endocrine and immune problems that we see in multiple different CDGs. We're trying to get a very good idea about how that's the same or different across multiple types. And so we have, um, in particular in our immunology department, we have a, a immunology um, specialist in deficiencies and a uh, immunology specialist in autoimmune and allergy. So they are looking extensively at both sides of immune function in glycosylation disorders. We do look at carbohydrate deficient transferrin analyses, but we know there are limitations to that testing and we know it changes over time and that there are periods of time where even children with known glycosylation abnormalities will have a normal carbohydrate deficient transferrin. So we're trying to track that. And we also look at N and O glycan profiling separately, urine oligosaccharides, and some other biomarkers. We're trying to define what those might be. We look at urine studies for a number of reasons, a lot of urine. We do do skin biopsies on all the patients, even if they've had skin biopsies previously, because having fibroblast cultures available can be very helpful for lots of testing, not just enzyme testing, uh, as we go through time. And one of the things, um, and then let me see, yeah. So, and on this next slide, in most subjects, we do a Shermer 2 test, which is a test for dry eyes. And interestingly, what's happened is we have a genetic ophthalmologist who works with us who identified first in the NGLI-1 population that they had extensively dry eyes and they could develop some scarring and neo new vascularization of their cornea because of their ongoing eye damage. Subsequently, he's been very interested to look at all types of glycosylation patients, and he's actually identified that seems to be a very common finding across all types. So the NGLI-1 CDG patients have very dry eyes, but all the other types that we've looked at also have dry eyes. 
um, which is important over time because we don't want them to develop any corneal scratches or injury. And so we've been able to um, inform patients and families to use lubricating eye drops. We look at auditory evoked potentials. So that is another way to assess hearing, but more uh, what's happening in the brain. So how do, if the middle ear is working fine and, and you think that sound is transmitting through the little bones, our cochlea, you still need to know if the eighth nerve to the back of the brain where sound is processed is working normally. And we have found abnormalities there in many different CDG types, and that's not a test typically done um, in other places, so we've added that. We do do a lumbar puncture, and I'm going to share with you some of our spinal fluid findings, and this has traditionally not been a place where anyone has looked at glycosylation, but we found some interesting things that may explain or, or lead us to other therapies since we know that intellectual disability and seizures and movement disorders are part of many CDGs. We really want to understand what is happening in the spinal fluid. We do EEGs to look at seizure activity. We have an incredible epileptologist working with us to try and see if he can identify seizure types that might be different across different disorders of CDGs. We're doing sleep studies. We found lots of sleep disturbance in these kids, which I'm sure a lot of the parents already can identify. We've looked at um, electromyelogram and nerve conduction studies. So a lot of the ataxia in these patients also seems to be um, because of a peripheral neuropathy, not just because of cerebellar involvement. So it's been important for us to be able to start to characterize that. And we've started to identify some autonomic dysfunction. So you can, you can look at that part of the nervous system at different points um, and at different ages in different ways. For many of the young children, the best we can do is what's called a quantitative sweat test. And many, many of them don't sweat normally, which suggests they may actually have some heat intolerance. We do metabolic card studies looking at their energy expenditure, which can help you direct dietary therapies so that the kids don't get obese. And we also, as you also, I'm sure, have noticed, we have um, swallow studies because many of the ch children have swallow and sleep disturbance. Some of our patients have had more advanced <coughs> um, d diagnostic things done, so we're starting to look at glycomics and proteomics. Uh, Lysotracker is a way to look at where acidic material is stored in cells. Traditionally, it's been used in a group of disorders called lysosomal storage disease, but we're using it now to uh, define some of our glycosylation abnormalities. We're doing an additional immunologic workup on hyperimmune responses to the live or attenuated viruses like rubella. That is actually a good thing for our patients. And um, we do sedated electroretinograms because many of the patients have retinal changes that our ophthalmologist wants to look at progression over time, and some of these patients really cannot cooperate with that test awake. And we're looking at optical coherence tomography, which is actually the thickness of the cornea of the eye. It seems to thin out over time in some of these patients. And some of the movement disorders or seizure disorders are what we call myoclonic. And so somatosensory evoked potentials is the best way to define what's happening there. So we've been able to define and then follow up on some pretty new and interesting things that may impact on management for movement disorders and seizure activity. And then we want to do longer EEGs on the second admission. The schedule is very busy. <laughs> so we bring usually the patients in on a Sunday. And then as you can see, we start quite early in the day. It is an extremely packed full week. And then families usually go home on Saturday. We have had on occasion reasons to keep families for a few extra days. So um, we just 
really encourage families that want to participate to come as partners or with a grandparent or someone else that can help you because it is so tiring. Um, but we learn a lot of information. We provide a ton of information at the end of the week and then obviously ongoing um, information. We have planned at this point annual follow-up. So we'd like to see the kids every year over time so that we can continue to track natural history, right, how they change over time. We won't be doing everything that we do the first time every single year. So uh, for things like MRIs, we're not doing those every single year. But we are really able to get a ton of information and, and then we'll follow up over um, years, we hope, to get a lot of good information. What we've seen so far um, is on this table, a little self-explanatory. I do want to point out, though, that we have a special collaboration in the United States with a rare disease consortia called the Sterile and Isoprenoid Research Consortium. Traditionally, those groups of disorders have included disorders in the cholesterol pathway, like smith limley opitz but they want to look at the Dolico CDGs because that is also in that pathway. And so we'll be asking Vanessa and other family organizations if there are families out there with children with Dolico disorders, then we really would like to see more of those. And then we, um, I think, have now seen the largest cohort of the new D glycosylation disorder, but we've also seen a widespread of more rare diseases as well. So far, we have identified that there's low CSF protein and albumin across all CDG types and low CSF IgG in some. There are neurotransmitter, uh, BH4, which is tetrahydrobiopterin, and cerebral folate abnormalities, some of which have been treated. We have the low tear production leading to the dry eyes. Um, in NGLI-1, we found a very specific abnormality through the brain stem for the eighth cranial nerve for how they are able to process hearing information. The low sweat, so hypohydrosis is just the decreased sweating. We have found pretty consistently elevated urine glycoaminoglycans. In the glycosylation group, which is important just because, and many of you parents may have seen this testing, was abnormal, but it leads physicians oftentimes to look for lysosomal storage diseases but not think about glycosylation disorders. And they all happen in the endoplasmic reticulum, and so it's important if you have this test to rule out both sets of um, disorders. And the hyperimmune response to rubella and rubeola um, vaccinations. We actually have now a new study with the um, Federal um, Drug Administration also um, with NIH to look at this more. And this is how you can get us. I'm the study coordinator, and um, I already talked about travel. We have a huge group of collaborators across multiple specialties inside and outside of NIH. And then most importantly, I think um, Christina Lamb has been our research fellow and our principal investigator for this protocol. And I have argued she's the first CDG fellow in the world. She has concentrated on nothing but CDGs for the last two years, and she's now interviewing for real jobs in America, so um, we will have another CDG clinical expert, at least in America. Um, Carlos Ferreira has been a biochemical genetics fellow who's worked with us over the course of this last year, and he's going to stay at NIH 40% of his time as an attending, so he'll still be working on the protocol with me. And Donna Krasnovich, who I think you all know, has been very, very active in glycosylation research. She is our primary um, clinical resource on this protocol. And then Dr. Gall is really the head of our institute and, and the undiagnosed diseases program who really pushed us to make this spin-off protocol. So that is the end. I purposely didn't have a ton of slides in case there were a lot of questions.